Okay, well, we'll make a start. Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's session on retention and engagement. Um, I, my name is Daniel Tramontana from BGL Corporate Solutions and um, I'm joined, I'll be doing this together with Ron Lesh, who is our CEO. Welcome, Ron. Good uh, afternoon, Daniel. And good afternoon to everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. And um, look, we're, we're going to go through what we believe is a really important topic around retention and engagement. Um, we know that the landscape is becoming more and more difficult. And we also know that retaining and attracting people is also becoming a lot more difficult. And what we would like to do is just to go through with you what's actually taking place in the landscape. And then also go through with you some of the things that we're doing to help better retain and engage our staff. Now, as we go forward, retention and engagement is going to be more important than ever before. And it's not something that you can just give it a thought of once a year or when it comes to the review time. It's going to be something that you have to give thought to on a daily basis because it becomes important for you to step into your future with confidence. So what I'm going to go through today together with Ron is we're going to set the landscape. We're going to talk about the importance of measuring engagement, how to look after your team members, the importance of powerful team member conversations, salaries and adjusting salaries and making sure that we're at market and that we're remunerating our people fairly and properly. The importance of one-on-one -on -one catch ups. We're then also going to give you a bit of an insight or a glimpse into some of the stuff that we do to measure engagement and to measure things like how ready our people are to come into the office and some of the things that you need to do as leaders to prepare your people. Because despite what's taken place, there is still a fair amount of hesitancy of people wanting to come in. We're going to talk about the mental health courses and the importance of initiating things like that throughout your offices because Mental health, as we know, um, is becoming more and more important of a topic for you to be able to not only deal with, but make sure that your managers and your people are able to deal with the situations when they arise. And then we're going to go through the, the culture amp surveys that we do, which allow us to better engage and understand our people. So one of the things that's been labelled at the moment that we know that we're hearing quite a lot of is this whole thing called the, re the great resignation. Now, Ron, I'd, I'd love to, to throw this over to you, but when it comes to the, the great resignation, Ron, what are some of the things that you're seeing and hearing and what's taking place? And maybe could you give us a little bit of an understanding as to why it's taking place? Yeah, well, look, uh, thanks, Daniel, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the Great Resignation, actually, I think, uh, I, I don't know where it was uh, originally termed, but I, I, I saw it in some HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review uh, publications and things that came through the last couple of months. And it, it, it's all come about because of, uh, of what's, what's been going on and people, effectively, because people are working from home, uh, they've lost their connection with their organisations. And uh, it's very easy to poach people who are working at home by themselves, who are disconnected from the people they work with. And uh, whether, whether we, uh, we like it or not, or we agree or we don't agree, people do need people. And uh, that's shown very much so through what's happened over the, the past couple of years or the past 18 months. Uh, and uh, where people haven't been with people, uh, they get disengaged, they get disconnected and they leave. So a lot of people didn't change jobs during COVID because it was a bit difficult to do so. Still probably a little bit difficult to do so, but not as hard as it was. Um, or probably more harder in Australia than it is in other places uh, which have opened up. But uh, uh, it's been termed the great resignation because all the people who've got this bent up anxiety to leave or to change employers um, has, uh, are really starting to make moves. And uh, I think every organisation is going to is going to suffer from this. Yeah, look, and, and what's really interesting is that there's a number of reasons for this. And some of the things that we've noted and that we've seen is that there's a lot around career progression. And with what's happened with the pandemic and lockdowns is that what we've found and what we're seeing is that a lot of people really haven't 
built their skill base. They really haven't expanded on their skill set. So pretty much what they were doing 12 and 18 months ago is pretty much the same as to what they're doing today. So what people are looking for is how can I better develop my skills? How can I advance my career? And the other big issue that we have at the moment is also, especially in this country, is the whole area of migration and the importance that migration plays in filling many of the the positions that we have within our organisations. So there's a huge amount of demand, I know, for accountants, and a competition is really heating up. And I'm not sure if you've seen it, but we've definitely seen it, is that some of the salaries and things that people are being offered with very little experience is phenomenal. And it's almost like, how do you compete with this? And we're, yes, we're, we're all about the importance of salary and making sure people are remunerated properly. But there's also a number of other things that we can do to improve the way that our people engage with us and then the way that we can also retain them. But just so that you know, there's about 83% of the organizations out there, and this was taken from the, the finance yahoo.com.au, there's about 83% of organizations are experiencing higher turnover. And believe it or not, and I've seen this confirmed a number of times, about 40% of people are seeking new roles. And there is a fight for good people. So whether you like it or not, people are looking at your staff and working out how on earth do I get them on my team because I desperately need resources. Now, mental health, um, we've spoken about that a little bit, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later on, but it is the uh, one of the highest priorities. And the way that we look after people's mental health and their well-being will also be a very determining factor into how well we're able to retain our team members and our staff. But one of the things I think that is important, just, just go back to that slide for a minute, Daniel, uh, is that uh, a lot of people say, oh, people are moving because of salaries. Well, yes, there is some movement because of salaries, um, but that's not the main reason people are moving. Uh, the main reason that people are moving is because they feel that they've stagnated over 18 months. And if they haven't had any training, um, if they haven't had the, the uh, opportunity to get training or do something or be, be promoted or move their careers forward, they really felt like, well, I've gone nowhere here. I'm going nowhere here. So I'm going. Correct. And it's definitely a big issue. And, the, the thing that you know really is important is that people can see that they've got an opportunity to grow and it's really important. Um, when it comes to the, the landscape, and we're looking at some Gartner research, um, what it's found is that people, are, like 25% are basically saying that their, their, their buoyancy about business and confidence about the, the jobs market is actually increasing. But what's happening is that of your team members, only about 16% are going above and beyond what they would normally do because there's exhaustion. And what's really been a prominent factor in all of this is that a lot of the the quality of managers has also dropped. And what it's done is it's actually forced many of us to rethink our working, our home life working balance and the hybrid model. Now, Ron, I'd, I'd just love your insight into the hybrid model, Ron, and what we've done at BGL and why you believe that, maybe explain what we've done, but then also go through why you believe it's really important to strike a balance between working from home and also working from the office. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people say, oh, I love working from home. It's great. It's fantastic. But the thing we've noticed about people working from home is that they don't switch off. And that leads to really leads to well, exhaustion. It, lead, it leads to them becoming disconnected from what they're doing. Um, it's really, look, I think there's, there's always been a, a need for people at times to work from home. And, and we've always encouraged that. And we've had our managers uh, working from home for many years. They've been able to take a day a week or a couple of days a week and, uh, and work from home, depending on what their needs are and depending on what family situation they're in and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I've got no issue with a hybrid workplace. I do have an issue with a workplace where everybody's working from home. I don't think you can teach culture over Zoom and I don't think you can retain people over Zoom. I think you need to have people coming into the office and they need to be with their teammates. And it's really fantastic to see when, and I'm sure in in some of the states that people are 
uh, where, where people are back in the offices that you, you see the camaraderie between people. And that's, that's really important, keeping people in an organization. So the, the whole idea of a hybrid uh, workplace, I, I think, you know, maybe one day, maybe two days a week, uh, working from home, uh, the rest of the time working in the office, uh, and, and depending on, on, I suppose, the circumstances of particular people, but giving people the flexibility to do that. But one of the things that I think is really important around this hybrid workplace is that when you have team meetings, that they're face to face. The people come in and that they do meet, um, that they have team social events, that they do all these sort of things. And that's all got to be part of the hybrid workplace. Yeah, agree completely. And, um, you know, it's actually because we talk about this quite often, Ron, is the importance of those incidental conversations that you have at the kitchen or you have while you're walking through the corridor or you have while you're just standing around talking and the importance of observation when it comes to understanding and knowing your people's well-being. Um, when it comes to the landscape, and it's actually interesting here, so I've picked up a little bit more research from Gartner, and I think this is really important, is that... I've done, but there was a comparison done between Australia and international about what are the things that are driving or attracting people and making people stay, and then what are the things that are keeping people away. So I've got attraction and attrition. And you'll see that in Australia, when it comes to attraction, compensation doesn't feature within the top three. But work-life balance, location, and respect does. Whereas when it comes to attrition, you see work-life balance is number one there also, but there's also this whole area of manager quality. And one of the things that's really important when it comes to people and engagement and retention is develop, firstly, putting the right managers in the right seats in the right position of the bus. And I, Ron, I'll come to you in a sec, but also being able to invest in them and making sure that you're, you're growing them as people and as leaders. Now, one of the things that astounded me at one point in time when it came around the whole idea of mental health, for example, and we know that in this time, it's a really important topic. But the statistic, and, and I believe I recall this correctly, about 50% of managers don't believe that mental health is an issue or an issue that they should be paying any attention to. That's 50%. And we know that today, yes, you need vision, you need leadership, you need, you know, you need performance management, you need all of that. But there's now into the equation has to come that whole area of mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Ron, what are some of the things that we do to, to build our managers? And what are some of the things that you do to build the managers? Because it's so important that we're getting the right people leading the people. Yeah, look, I, I, I suppose there's, there's a whole lot of different ways to look at man managers and leadership. One of my big complaint, so one of the, the things that I, that I, I don't know if it's a complaint as much as, a, as something that, that I see is when organisations bring in managers externally, it says to me that the organisation is not doing something right necessarily, unless they're bringing them in in an area where they don't have the expertise or they don't have the skills. Uh, but if you're talking about a general management position, if you're bringing, if people are coming in from outside, um, there's a there's a real issue with that. Yeah. You know, at, at BGL we've we've employed managers in roles where we don't have the expertise, um, or we don't have the people internally who can move up into a role. But where there's a, an opportunity to move somebody internally, I would always prefer to move somebody internally than to get somebody externally. And I, I look at our management team, and the vast majority have started on the help desk in support and have worked their way up to uh, other positions. Now, obviously, they're not software developers necessarily, so maybe you need to go externally for those positions. Uh, HR, maybe marketing. There's, 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 I suppose, areas where we don't necessarily recruit from at a, at a lower level, but maybe more at a, at a, at a sort of more mid-level. But as a general rule, I think you want your management people to come through the teams and to, and to really build their own skills so they get to a point where they can be managers of people within the team. Yeah, and one of the things that we often underestimate is the, the, the importance of having good managers and leaders within the business because a lot of people do leave because of the people that are actually meant to be looking after them. 
And the other one that's a big one there is also respect. And people want to be respected and people want to be heard and creating safe environments where people can have that ability to be heard and respected is really important. And respect is something that should, should, should be driven throughout the organisation and people should be embraced for who they are, for what they bring, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what they represent. It's just so important to respect people for who they are and giving them the opportunity to grow. Um, Look, I've, I've always said, and one of the great things I said that uh, I think that Martin Luther King said was that uh, you, to judge people by their character, um, not to judge them by anything else. And, uh, and, and really that's, that's just so important. I think in, especially in Australia, but in today's environment, it's, it's just so important. And that leads to respect. So as you can see, when it comes to attrition and attraction, international and um, on both fronts is compensation, whereas while it's really important here also, it's not the main driver. So to feel that you must compete on salary and you must match everything that goes on, well, at some point you've got to realise that it's more than just salary that people hang around great businesses for. Now, let's talk about looking after uh, the, the team members at BGL. Now, what we want to do here is give you an insight into what we do, to give you a bit of an understanding as to what we do very much on a daily basis. And we ensure that we look after our best people. We give them opportunity, we grow them, we develop them. We, we don't micromanage people. We we're definitely don't do that. We like to give, when you employ people because they're smart and hopefully smarter than you and better than you and can bring more to the table than you can bring. And it's really important to be able to release these people to, to be able to excel. The other thing that we do very often is checking in on people. Now, this is something that's done throughout the management team and it's something that we really encourage. And when I mean by check-in, I'm not talking about an SMS or I'm not talking about you know, a message on Slack. We're actually talking what we try to um, try to, to encourage is things like phone calls. Because hearing someone's voice is very different to reading a text. Or if we can, try and meet up with people in person, which is an even, an even better way to check in on people. But we need to really ensure that we're checking in on people. Now, when it comes to salary, we've spoken a little bit about that, but if people need to be paid fairly for what they do. And one of the things that we've done really well at BGL, I believe, over the period of time, we're going to talk a little bit about engagement, is making sure that people have the resources available to be able to do their job and to do their job properly. Now, what I'd like to just flick over to Ron about here is, Ron, just what are some of the things that we've done during this time, both internal and external, to make sure that people are properly resourced when it comes to making decisions? Yeah, well, look, I suppose every organisation, uh, I would say, out there suffers from a lack of resources at time and times. And for us, it's been difficult through this period because most of our intake of people are, are accounting grads and there is a huge shortage of accounting grads at the moment. Um, we, all, we also, I suppose, have the same uh, issue with, uh, with, with recruiting developers at the moment because uh, software developers are, uh, are difficult to find at the moment. We have a, a significant shortage in Victoria. Um, so look, I suppose what, what we've tried to do is make it easy for people to work as they, to do the things they need to do and to make sure that they have access to the people who are their, their managers so that those managers can help them through wherever they, whatever they get to. We've also done a, a lot of things to try to keep people connected by uh, uh, sending out care packs to people of all different sorts of things. Um, so so we've, we've, we've tried to do things like that. And we've, uh, we have had an allowance and we've had this for a while that the managers can spend an amount per team member per year on anything that they think is going to help that team member with either doing their job or, or feeling better about themselves or all sorts of things. So we've done a lot of things around that. And we've, we've also done, I suppose, uh, run a lot of programs and things for people, things from, uh, I was talking about this at a, my CEO group on, on Tuesday, that uh, we've done a whole lot of things like uh, uh, yoga and body fit and cooking and cocktail classes and uh, 
um, of, we even did the, the BGL 100. Uh, so we tried to do a whole lot of things to really, I suppose, get people involved with the other people in their teams. You know, we're still waiting for you, Ron, to join us as a celebrity chef. Yeah, not my, not my, not my skill base. I'll defer to people that are good at cooking. Uh, maybe I get my, maybe I get my wife to, to hop into that one. She's, she's pretty good. Uh, just to add to what Ron said too is that we've done things like we've made available an EAP program, employee assistance program program, which. We've not just made available to our team members, but at one stage we also made it available to their families and extended families because we had some people that were really struggling without outside of their immediate circle. One of the things that I love that we do is that, and this has been a difficult time on many fronts, but you know, when someone has uh, they've lost a loved one or they've gone through a traumatic experience or there's been sickness in the family or there's just been a real difficulty, what we've done is that we send things out so that they've got their dinners covered for a few days. And we'll go through things like the Arancini lady, or we'll go through different food companies to cover people's meals for a few days so that they don't have to worry about food. They're just little things that we're doing that make the difference. And they're the things that you will be remembered for. And other things that we've also done is that, you know, we, 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 we try to get creative. As Ron said, we do cooking shows, do all these types of things to give people an opportunity to get engaged. I should say, Daniel, probably the most most creative is the footy lunch uh, that we've done that we did last year, and we've got coming up actually again uh, this year in a few weeks. So, so please do register for that. We've got a uh, a great lineup of uh, ex Aussie rule footballers, and we're going to have a bit of fun for yeah. for an hour or so. And and that's a really important part too. And I encourage you to to look at this for your organisations is. What we've done at BGL this last six weeks or so is that we've we, what we've done is we've done we've put together a community series where we give back to the community, and believe me, people love to be a part of teams and organisations that give back. It's great to talk about our successes. It's great to talk about how much we've grown and everything else, but people also want to be part of something bigger, and we've deliberately gone about pushing out to the public really important initiatives, which we believe will help them grow. But we don't do it because we want an applause. We don't do anything like that. We believe in giving back and people love to be part of organizations that give back. Um, one of the other important things that we do here is we make sure that we check in on people's workloads. We look for abnormalities in conversations or texts or the ways that people respond to things. And we see that as a prompt to be able to speak into people's lives or to just check in on people. But one of the things that we, we do and, and I encourage you to do is those that you work with direct, get to know them personally. There's more to a person than just work. And when it comes to rewarding them, record, re reward them personally. Do things that they can identify with and they can embrace and, and jump on and say, yeah, I can use this. So we've got people in our organization might be into bike riding or they might be into fitness type, they might be into cooking. Do things that are customised to them. And, Ron, how important is that, Ron? Oh, look, I think it's it's really important that whatever, the, the, the things that we do are things that people get involved in personally. Um, and, and, you know, it's great to have team rewards, but with the team reward, it should be a reward that's something that they're going to appreciate. Um, and, and we've done all the sorts of different things over the years, uh, uh, be it from movie vouchers for people who like who are movie buffs, um, be it, be it uh, tickets to this or tickets to that, um, be it uh, a particular uh, something that somebody will appreciate. So I think it's, it's really important to get to know people and to, to reward those people according to, accordingly. Um, you don't want to be sending somebody a, a bottle of wine if they don't drink. Um, so you, you've got to, you really need to be aware of what people like and what people don't like to make, to make the things that you do really work for them. The other thing, I, by the way, I think that is important is I try personally, uh, I try and get away from phone calls often with people. I'd rather do a, a Google Meet or a Zoom session or, or a Zoom call or whatever, or a, uh, because it's just, you know, talking to people on the phone, you can do any time. What you really want to do is connect with someone. You can't connect with someone if you don't see their face. 
And just that line item there, which we'll just touch on very briefly before I move on, is that $100 per team member per year. What we do is we allocate that for the managers to spend on their team members, and we don't question that how that $100 is spent. It's up to them. They do whatever they like with that money, and they can effectively reward their people accordingly. So <clears throat> just as leaders, and we picked this up from Harvard Business Review, what are some of the things that we're doing that are causing our people to quit? And the, the, the Harvard Business Review came up with eight points that basically attribute people leaving to who we are as leaders. And I'll just go through these very briefly, but first one is setting inconsistent goals and expectations. Things that are beyond people's reach, which pretty much they know that they can't attain or they can't attend to, and that are not aligned with the organizational goals and values. Having too many process constraints. So too many things or too many loops and hurdles that they need to go through to be able to do their job properly. Another thing that we that, that leaders are doing that make their employees quit is making them wasting their resources. And this is not talking about money. This is talking about time. And I'm sure that all of you have been through this, um, but you probably find that you're in more Zoom meetings and in more different you know, meetings and engagements that you're just sitting there saying, I don't really need to be here. Well, the way that you feel is exactly the same way your employees feel. Don't waste their time. They want to be productive and they want you to respect their time. Now, I love this one. And Ron, I know that you love this because I know we saw Jim Collins in New York and, you know, talks about the, you know, the, the, the good to great and about putting people in the wrong roles. Ron, what's, why is this just so important that as leaders that we get this right? Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's probably one of the key ones, isn't it? That uh, people often get promoted into positions they're not really suited for. Um, we try not to do that. Uh, it's, it's, people have to be confident that the role that they're moving into, that they're capable of doing. And uh, um, we, we're, we're, we try here to move people around from one team to another because that's part of giving them a, a varied workplace. But you've got to make sure that the role you move them into is a role where they've got the skills to do the job properly. And, and that comes really back to the, in some respects, the next one, assigning boring or overly easy tasks to people that, again, that just, uh, people just aren't happy with that. And they, they get bored and they leave. They, they make a decision to do something else. Um, the last couple, uh, failing to create a psychologically safe culture uh, is, is something that we've all got to be wary of, especially these days. Creating a work environment that's too safe is also a problem because you need people to challenge and to challenge themselves. Uh, and the last one, leading with bias, but it seems to be a big issue in the States, probably more than an issue here. And, and it, just, it just tends to be this... Um, I don't know whether it's true or whether it's not true, but there tends to be this whole thing around race in America and the way that people lead around race. Um, it's not such an issue in Australia, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that everybody is treated fairly and equally, no matter what role they're in, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, uh, all those sort of things is that everyone's treated the same. Um, and I don't think we should be going out of the way to, to, um, to treat people differently because, uh, uh, in a team environment, you need to be consistent with the way you treat people. Yeah, bias is a really hard one because you know we all we all have biases, but the most important thing there is being emotionally intelligent enough to know when your biases kick in, and to be able to put aside bias and deal with the reality of things because that's really important. Um, so one of the things that we really do encourage, and, you know, this really, boy, we, we're going to show our age here, on. but I remember when we went to see Jack Welch. You, um, your age. No, your age. <laughs> <laughs> we went to see Jack Welch. Um, it was about early 2000s. And it really hit us like a ton of bricks when he spoke about the importance of candid conversations. And this is something that we generally as leaders shy away from because we find it too uncomfortable. But I can tell you that even in my experience, I know this is something that Ron has really encouraged and pushed, is that you need to, be, you need to make yourself uncomfortable to be comfortable with where you're at and with where your people are at. So there's nothing wrong with asking your people, 
are you happy? There's nothing wrong with asking them, what are you not happy about? We have these conversations, my team members, and I have these conversations around the lines of, are you looking elsewhere? Why are you looking elsewhere if you are? Developing insights into our people and understanding what makes them happy, what makes them not happy, and then understanding where they're at allows us to better serve them and lead them and grow them and hopefully retain them. But one of the things that, that that's really important too when it comes to, to team member conversations, and Ron, I'm going to bring you into this one, is why is it important to talk about people's careers and why as leaders should every person have a documented training plan? Because one of the things that we do is we talk a lot about training and development, but yet no one really has much formalized so that people are clear as to where they're going. Mm. Yeah, look, it's something that we've been talking about a bit recently is that while we offer training to everybody and we say to the team, if you want to, um, if you want to uh, go to a training course, uh, just tell us and, and we'll organize for you to go to it. But we haven't really probably had as many formalized uh, uh, training plans as we should have in place. So that's certainly something we're going to be working on. Uh, one of the main reasons people leave organizations is because they don't feel they're going anywhere. So part of that is having a training plan for where, where is this person going? Where is their career going? Where, where do they see themselves in a year, in two years, in three years, in five years? What do they want to be doing? Um, and asking those questions uh, of, of, of the team members. Um, you know, it's fine that they're doing what they're doing now, but they might have much greater plans for themselves. They might want to be doing something else. So uh, I think it's important that we, we can help people to build those skills. They may stay with us or they may not stay with us, but they're more likely to stay with us if, if they can see that, one, they can get the training that they want, and secondly, that training can be used within the organisation uh, to, to better what we do. Yeah, and look, and, and one of the things that, that we all find frustrating is when it comes to learning that someone, for example, is going to resign or they come with a resignation letter, and then the reasons behind the resignation were things that we could really have addressed should we have just known or asked or just been a little bit more curious about that person and what, what makes, what triggers them and what makes them want to stay somewhere. And being on that front foot is really important because it allows you to better understand and customize that individual's experience. Because at the end of the day, people want to grow and they just want to be in an, in an organization where they feel that they can grow and contribute. Um, one of the things that we also do too, which we would love to share with you is, is our one-on-one -on -one catch ups. Now, Ron, I'm going to talk a little bit about culture amp, but I think that you know you're you're really well positioned to talk about this and, and what it does for us. But Ron, why do I'm not sure if any of you have heard of, of culture amp, but we use culture amp to measure engagement. And one of the, the classic sayings is what doesn't get measure, measured doesn't get done. And we basically have now developed a system some 18 months ago, which allows us to measure engagement and, in, and, and to measure well-being. I'm going to talk a little bit about it from um, my one-on-one -on -one experience, and then Ron, I'll get you to talk about the, the engagement um, experience that we've got. But what Culture Amp allows me to do is to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with my team members. Now, what I do, depending on where they are and where they're at in their journey, some I meet with every week, some I meet with every two weeks, some I meet with every four weeks. And what the tool allows me to do is by just very quick options, a couple of very quick options that you've got on there, your, your team members provide you feedback as to where they're at. So one of the things could be, you know, like I'm, I'm, my well-being is good. Or one month it could be my well-being is not good. And you can very easily see where they're at. And all it does is it allows you to open up conversations. And I found this an incredible tool that not only gives me a great insight as to where the, the, the team members or the managers are at, but it also then allows them to provide feedback, which then I can add my feedback to. And I've always got a record of conversation, a gauge as to where they're at. And then also I've got something that I can always go back to when it comes to performance reviews. But Ron, what, what's, what, why have we, how have we used Culture Amp to, to, to work out engagement, Ron? Well, look, I, I think there's, look, there's a number of things around Culture Amp. The, fir the first time I was introduced to Culture Amp was at um, FinTech Week in the UK a few years ago. I actually once went to one of their meetups 
And uh, I'll be honest, I thought it was a little bit, I hope I can say this word, I thought it was a little bit wanky at the time. But um, I could see the benefits that it, that it could potentially have for us. And I asked our guys to go out and have a look at it. And that was before the, a lot of the performance management stuff was in there. Uh, and I thought at that stage that it wasn't really where we needed to, where it needed to be. And that if we were going to, to really put something in it, in to help us manage people better that it had to be more comprehensive and then we we came back and looked at it a couple of years later and they'd done a lot of work they'd bought a business that in, included all this stuff around uh, around catch-ups around performance reviews um and and we made the decision to implement it and and I, one of the reasons that we were uh listed as the sixth most um or sixth best uh technology workplaces in Australia and New Zealand last year was because of the stuff that we've done with Culture Amp. Because what it gives us the ability to do and what we did in the beginning was we set a baseline to know where we were at. So we did a survey back in May 2020 and it told us where we were at as an organisation, told us what issues and what things we needed to do to look at. Um, a number of the complaints from, or a number of the comments from people were around the offices and we therefore got our landlord off his butt to do a lot of uh, renovations and clean things up and, and make the office a better place for people to come to. Um, it also then allowed us to really see where people were at. And that was really the next stage was to, to work out from there where our world our well-being, to be able to monitor it, to be able to ask questions about it. Um, if you don't ask the questions, you don't get the answers. And uh, a lot of people uh, just don't ask questions of their team um, and then get surprised when they leave. So this whole idea of using it to, to drive engagement with people and get people to give you feedback. But it's no use, again, if you get feedback and you don't act on it, then it's a waste of time. You've got to act on the feedback, and that, that's just so important uh, in terms of any tools that you use to, to do that. The other side of it is, and the one thing that uh, that I've always said around people resigning and people maybe going to work cover to say you, you got rid of them or you sacked them or you sacked them unfairly or whatever, is that there's not enough documented. One of the ability, the things that this does, and I suppose we've had a we had a document system for a documentation system previously. But one of the things that this does is give you the ability to, to document everything that's going on with a team member. So if you have to manage somebody out of the organisation or ask somebody to leave, you have enough supporting evidence as to why you've done that. So if you do ever end up at, uh, at Fair Work, you can print it all out and give it to the Fair Work people and say, well, here's the whole history of everything and everything that's happened uh, along the way. So this has not been something that's happened in the last five minutes. And, and the other great thing about good employment engagement systems is that they also tell you where to focus your efforts on to get the maximum return and the greatest impact. Um, so just as leaders in developing and retaining talent, then what I'm going to do after is I'm actually going to go take you through a little bit of the feedback from Culture Amp. Um, make sure that in, in order for us to develop and retain top talent, ask the questions and get the insights. And we, we went through this a little bit before. Create more on-the-job opportunities. Don't just keep people siloed into one particular area, one particular team where they do the same thing day in, day out. Add to this then the varying of learning experiences and whether it be client-facing stuff or, you know, in, there might be in, in the area of implementing new systems or processes or engaging with clients within different industries, whatever it may be, vary their experience. Give them the chance to get a taste of multiple areas of the business rather than just one area of the business. Providing regular feedback. And that is really important, which is why we also use Culture Amp because it prompts the feedback and it forces us to give the feedback. And it also forces the, the recipients to give the feedback, which is equally as important. And really as leaders manage your time. And what I mean by that is that if you wanna retain and develop top talent, you need to make time for them. You need to invest for them. You need to make yourself available for them. Um, when it comes to just a, big, a quick question that's come through, um, yes, Melissa, these slides will be made available at the end of the presentation. We're more than happy to share those. Um, now, once we talk about BGL team members, we've spoken a little bit about before, but I just want to be able to talk about one little thing that I don't think that we do very well as organisations. 
And that is celebrating successes. And while we, you know, we put along the work and we, we many a time take for granted what people do, it's really important to stop and celebrate people, to stop and celebrate the successes, to acknowledge where you've come from to where you're going. It's really important that we take those moments to acknowledge those that have got us to where we are. Ron, where did we first hear about this and why was this so important to what we do as a culture? Yeah, look, I, I can't remember who was the first person who said it. I know that Simon Sinek said it a few times early in the piece and it, some of it came out of him and um, Marcus Buckingham talked about it. Um, so we've sort of had a lot of people over the years talk about the the need to, to, to celebrate and to, to uh, really... I suppose, look at the successes that we have as an organisation, look at the successes of our people, look at people who've moved through various roles and what they've contributed moving through all those roles. And, you know, I look at people here who started in support and maybe went into client success and maybe went into data services and maybe then ended up in, in, in sales and, and mar or, in, or in account management. Um, and, and you sort of look at where people have, have moved around the organisation, how many have moved from support into, the, into our product teams. So I, I just, I think all of that just uh, uh, sort of leads to this whole thing around um, getting people to be doing things they like. If they're doing things they like and they think that they're contributing, then they're going to stay. But then you've got to celebrate that. You've got, to, you've got to celebrate that internally. You've got to give people incentives as to, to want to do these things. Um, you know, we, we set targets here. We set our BHAGs, our big, hairy, audacious goals. And when we achieve those goals, uh, no matter what those goals are, we, we have a function and we celebrate for everybody. So we, we do something. We celebrate the uh, end of the financial year and the end of the calendar years and, and all of those things with the whole team. So we really try and get people involved in, in celebrating what they do. We, we celebrate when we pick up new clients um, and the account management team celebrates when they make, uh, I suppose, uh, good, good sales or good, good progression with a particular client. So we celebrate all of those things because it's really important. And, and the success stories lead to more success. It gives people confidence. And it also leads to the to why I suppose you, you end up with a lot of awards and things like that is because the team members are enjoying what they're doing. They're working hard to give clients the best experience and, the, and they, get, they know that achieving something is going to end up with a celebration. So it sort of it sort of has a as an effect that continues uh, time and time again. Yeah. Um, just um, just something that came out of the Leaders Lab report, and I've got a link on there. So if you get the slides, you can go to the link. Um, it's really interesting as to what's taking place within leadership in Australian workplace, and I'm just going to go through this quickly. But only 22 percent of leaders are actually thriving with ease. But what's really interesting about what's going on and, and the uncertainty that's going on is that of all the leaders in Australia and feedback came from workers and from team members, only 27% of team members believe that leaders are creating a culture of care, compassion, appreciation and emotional and, and most of them are, are lacking in emotional wisdom. So you can really see where there's huge gaps in terms of leadership, but also you can also see what people are looking for and that what we're delivering are actually quite different. And it's really important that through these surveys and the things that Ron's mentioned and that we've gone through, that you're, you're leading for your people and that when it comes to um, creating culture, you are the number one person responsible for that culture. You don't leave culture to the people at the bottom of the organisation or the, the person who's just come into the organisation because if you don't take a stance for culture and you don't deliberately focus on culture on a daily basis, the people that come in that don't hold your values and believe me, they sneak in, will end up defining and making your culture toxic. So it's really important that as leaders, we take ownership for our organisations, our people and the culture. And um, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to share the BGL engagement survey 
for August 2021. And this has just come off the, the press. So it's, you know, we're, we're definitely putting ourselves out there. But I just want to give you a little bit of an insight as to how we use this information to, to better engagement. Now, we're sitting at an engagement rate of 85%, which is outstanding. So it sits at about 20% higher than the, the industry average. We and also... I, sh I should say, Daniel, the average engagement throughout the world across all industries is 17%. That's one seven. Uh, and that was discussed by two leaders or two people at the last business forum we went to a couple of years ago. Um, so when I, when I saw 17, I thought, God, that's dreadful. In the IT industry, it's about 70, 70 is the average. That's right. So uh, we're sitting well above that engagement average. It tells us we must be doing something right, whether we, whether we know we are or we don't know we are, but we're certainly doing something right. Well, what's great about this is that it tells us that we've got strong leadership, that our people feel aligned and that enablement and engagement is strong. And these are the things that are really important to us as an organisation. Now, there are things on there, I'm going to come to those in a moment, which show us that we're not doing too well and all we need to focus on. But as you can see, when you've got an engagement rate sitting at those levels, you've got a lot of things that are going well and you're doing a lot of things right. And really, it's just the small tweaks and the differences and the changes that you make that can actually boost that a little bit higher. The I other... was going to say, you can't be everything to everybody. No, too. absolutely not. So that's, the, that's the other thing that's important. While you can try and do as much as you possibly can, there are always going to be people who uh, don't care, are not interested, and who just want to come to work and go home every day. And, and, and Ron, we make no excuse really where, you know, if we've got a, an organisation that's engaged at 90% and then one person comes through with something a little bit absurd or whatever it may be, we don't adjust our culture to accommodate the one, unless it's a health and safety or it's a workplace you know, law, whatever. But we're very mindful and deliberate of our culture, aren't we, Ron? And how much time do we spend preserving it? Mm. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's very true. We, uh, you know, culture is very important. If you want to, from our perspective, it's, it's something we've always seen ourselves as, as, as having a, a good culture at BGL. I don't think we've ever been able to expound it or measure it until we put Culture Amp in to be able to yeah. do that. Um, and, and in some respects, Culture Amp has probably given us, some, given us some satisfaction that we have been doing the right thing over the years. But what it's also given us the ability to do, which we haven't been able to do over the years, is things like, for example, a return to office survey, um, which would have been very difficult to do if we didn't have a tool like Culture Amp. Yeah. So, so this is our, and, and look, and, and the reason we brought this up is because I know it's going to be something that we're all going to be confronted with at some point in time. I mean, there's a couple of states that, are, that this doesn't apply to, but or it doesn't apply to yet, but the, this return to office was an interesting survey that we did. And what you can see here is that of a sample size of 125 people, only 63% were actually felt that they're ready to come back to the office. Now, on the bottom there, you can see what are the factors that are affecting this. The, the employees feel that they're assisted. They believe that they're getting the right feedback, but you can see on the bottom there, that we need to do more when it comes to the knowledge of safety measures, better educating our managers to be able to bring them back safely. And we need to do a little bit more around the safety measures. Now, when it comes to safety measures, it's not as if they're in place, but we probably just need to educate people on them more and maybe communicate them more. But when people haven't come into the office for such a long time, they actually haven't seen what we've been able to do to make it safer. So this is real information at your fingertips, which allows you to prepare for key events and for things that are taking place within, within your organisation. And can I, can I just say the other one that we, oh, you can leave that or move to the next slide, doesn't matter, Daniel. The other one that we did uh, the last couple of days was uh, a survey or a single question survey really around va uh, vaccination to know how our team felt about being, getting vaccinated. Now, it's going to be, that's going to be an issue that everybody's going to have to grapple with over the next Correct. Or over the next six to 12 months, or probably even sooner than that, is, is what, the, what you're going to require in your workplace around vaccinations. Um, now, ours was very interesting. I think it came back with 81% said they're going to get vaccinated. 
83%, Ron. 83% said they're going to get vaccinated. Six, uh, 16% said that they will consider they are considering it but haven't made a decision and there was a couple of percent that said no so what do what do we do as a workplace um uh, around that uh what do we say to people and that's something we've been grappling with and we've sort of our view has really been that uh, whether you get vaccinated or not is a personal decision it's not a decision that bgl should be making for our team it's a decision people need to make for themselves um, are we going to stop people coming into the office who are vaccinated? We have no intention of doing that unless it becomes law that we that we have to do it. Um, because again, it, it's we think it's important that people make their own decisions around this, uh, and not that we make those decisions for them. So this is one everyone's going to have to grapple with over the next couple of months because it's going to become an issue in workplaces. And we've already seen what some major corporates have done. And I think we're going to see more retailers do it. And I think we're going to see uh, your COVID um, vaccination status attached to your QR code at some point in time, if they get it right. Um, so that when you go to check in somewhere, it won't let you check in if it's a place that says everyone's got to be vaccinated to get in. So I think there's going to be some interesting things around that. You've seen what's happening in, in France. That hasn't gone viral anywhere else that I'm aware of at the moment. Um, there, there is a bit of it in Singapore that you, they're not allowing you to go to places unless you're vaccinated, and, and a bit of it in the US as well. Uh, sporting events and things like that, concerts. I think uh, Bruce Springsteen was the first one to come out and say, um, I'm not letting anybody who's not vaccinated come to my events. Yep. So we're going to see more of this and uh, people have got to make decisions what they want to do. We, I don't think as an employer, we can make those decisions for them. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as a management team, we've always said that we're going to get, we're going to get vaccinated um, and we are. Uh, that we are partially or we are at the moment. And a lot of people at BGL have already had both shots as well. Um, so we, we're just encouraging them to continue to do that. Yeah, and look, and, and with this whole office return, it, it is a challenge, but I think that as leaders, you need to take a stance. And apart from the fact that it's important that people come together, um, it's really important that people have that social engagement, that interaction, the ability to come together and learn of each other and grow of each other and get back to that bit of camaraderie and that whole thing of learn, growing from problem solving, which is so much being missed. But the thing that, that, that we're very big on um, and that we have pushed is that we actually asked our people when we're open to come in three days a week and we asked our managers to lead the way. And that it was really important, we believe, that at least two days a week, the whole team or your whole team comes together where they can see each other, where they can, you know, do the high five or, you know, you've got to watch your social distancing, but where you can do certain things. But it's really important because I, I know from my personal experience um, throughout this whole time, and we are an allowed industry, Ron and I have been coming in. And for our mental health, it's been great to be able to be away from home to be away from to be in the office and to be able to just spend time together and to be able to talk through things and do things in person it's benefited us enormously and many of the people that 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 that, that don't believe are affected don't realize how much they need it until they come into the office and that's what we've found and you know we're, we're doing other little things too like we'll have cooking days where you know, at some point, you know, we, or it was actually the other week, we had a few people in and we, a few of us cooked for the team members. And it was just really nice to be in a room. And obviously we, we respected all the distances and the safety measures, but we just did things to bring people together, to bring that sense of community back together. And Ron, I'm going to get you to, 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 to this will be the last point. Many people have to admit that culture has taken a massive hit during this time. And it has. COVID has actually broken the very fabric that brings us together as people and has really impacted culture. And I'm going to leave this to Ron to finish with, but I'm going to say one thing, and I said it before. As leaders, you are responsible for culture. You need to lead the way. You need to make it a part of your every day. And one of the things that, that we've been really mindful of is when it comes to our culture, promoting the good things, the values, the engagement. But then also one of the things that we've also done is made sure that 
we've absorbed fear that we're trying to negate the negativity that goes out there. We're trying to negate the uncertainty that's taking place. And Ron, I think that last year when this all happened, I just want you to tell people what you did when you first came out and there was so much uncertainty about jobs, about their, their, their workplace, around their future. What did you do and why did you see that really as a pivotal moment at BGL during this pandemic? Yeah, look, I, I think the, the, the first thing that we did when this whole pandemic started last year and looking at all the uncertainty and all the things that were going on is we, we had a team meeting. We did it over Zoom, obviously, at that stage because we only, only could. And I think the first thing that I said to everybody was your jobs are secure. Um, don't worry about your job. Worry about your family. Worry about your health. We obviously didn't know that much about the, the virus at that point in time. But worry about, really worry about yourself. You're going to have a job. We're not sacking anybody. We're not retrenching people. Um, your job is is safe. Uh, and I, I hope that that gave people security and, and confidence that they were going to, con that the, everything was going to continue. As, as time went on through the whole pa pandemic last year, this year, and of course, we live in the, in the city that's been most locked down of all cities. I was lucky I missed the ones earlier this year. Um, but the one thing that's, that we've, that's come out of all of this is you cannot build a culture remotely and it's very difficult to maintain a culture remotely. Zoom is not great on culture because people don't turn on cameras. One of the things that I've tried to get people to do when I'm in meetings, certainly if I'm in a meeting, everyone's got to turn on the camera, but e even um, uh, when we have a, a, a team meeting, uh, I will see you know maybe 30 or 40 people without the cameras on. Um, and that concerns me because why haven't they got the cameras on? What are, they, what are they hiding at home that they're sitting sitting behind? Are they sitting on their bed uh, with their computer on their lap in their pyjamas rather than actually treating work as a work day? Um, one of the things that has come out of all of this uh, with the things that I've been reading is you've got to, even if you're working at home, you've got to do what you would normally do in the morning. So you should be getting up and if you normally have a shower and then have breakfast, then go to work. Hopefully that's not in all in the same room, but that you can actually do that. Uh, and, and sitting around your pajamas, I, I think, is actually uh, not a really good. Is it's just not good for your for your mental health. So the things that we worked on were, and the things that we found was you can't build a culture remotely. You need to get people in. You need to keep yeah. doing stuff, but you just can't build culture remotely. It's the same way you can't induct remotely either. Uh, inducting remotely is really difficult because you can't teach people culture over Zoom so or over Meet or over any of these things. So yeah. the whole idea of people getting together, um, spending at least three days a week in the office, I, I just think is so important for people's mental health, for building the culture in your organisation, for continuing with engagement, for keeping your team together. All of those things tell us that people need to be together. Yeah. And look, and um, I'm going to I'm going to finish up on this because we're, we're we're at the conclusion of the webinar. But one of the things that 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 I've seen and it's come through in feedback is that people one of the people's biggest battles into coming back to the office will be the inconvenience of actually getting dressed and coming to work. Mm. So you're not going to be dealing with this whole thing of safety. I mean, you got you got to deal with that. But it's going to be you almost have to train people again of what it means to get up earlier to get dressed, to get themselves ready to come to work. Mm. It's and crazy. people are going to have fears of public transport for a while and, yeah. and all sorts of things. So they're going to have to take all those into account as well. Yeah. But the end result is people do need to get to work. They do need to get back to the office. Well, Ron, thank you so much for uh, for today. And um, look, on, on behalf of BGL, that, that's pretty much our, the, the conclusion of our webinar today. And um that was just a little bit of an insight into who we are at BGL, what we do and the way that we go about things. And hopefully by providing you a little bit of insight about the landscape, about what's going on and some of the things that we do, that you can walk away with some things to, to better not only your life, but that of your people. Um, and I would like to finish on one thing when it comes to the mental health side of things is that one of the things that we've done at BGL is that every single leader at BGL or manager we have basically put them through the mental health first aid course. And I think I was trying to work out some ratios today, Ron. Um, 
we have one person trained up for every six people. That's how seriously we're taking it. Mm. Yes, it's an investment of time and money, but we think that having those sort of ratios, the one to 10, the one to 20 person trained up in the area of mental health first aid, not only emphasize an important point as to what's important to us, but also demonstrates to your people that you're fed income about their well-being. Mm. And Ron, you know, thank you for, for getting behind all that because it's just such an important initiative. Yeah. Look, I think it's important managers recognize when they're when their team members have got mental health issues and this the, doing the courses and everything like that really to, does help to do that. So look, if any of you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat if you like, and we're happy to hang around for a few minutes. If not, um, thank you for joining us today. A recording of the webinar will be made available to you. We'll email that out to you together with the notes so you can grab those too. And if you'd like to know anything else or like to know more, drop us a line and we would love to hear with, from you. And um, I suppose I'd just like to finish on this last note is that and that is to, I know I recognize many of the names on the, on the webinar and I just want to thank you on behalf of Ron, myself and BGL for your incredible support, um, for the fact that you stood by us through this time and um, we appreciate it and we don't take it for granted. So thank you for, for your support and for sticking by us through such long seasons. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get to RegTech next year on in March and see many of these wonderful people. That's certainly the plan. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank afternoon. you so much.